A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences from writers to musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Sarah Lucas, one of the most significant artists of her generation in Britain and internationally. Her work primarily consists of sculpture, but it's often presented in distinctive installations in dialogue with photography in the form of print or or wallpaper. Sarah's work is characterised by sardonic and ribald humour, informed by colloquial British language, but also shot through with feminist theory and social commentary. Formed from a wealth of materials, many of them everyday found objects like newspapers, food, furniture, cigarettes and clothing, her sculptures almost always evoke the body, however crudely reduced or abstracted. And while a humdrum frankness and bawdiness are ever-present, Lucas's sense of the strange and the uncanny locate her work within the legacy of Dada, surrealism and absurdist art in Europe and the US. Sarah was born in 1962 in London and studied at Working Men's College between 1982 and 1983, London College of Printing between 83 and 84, and Goldsmiths College between 84 and 87. It was at Goldsmiths that she joined a group of students that would form part of the Young British Artists, or YBAs, and transform British art in the 1990s. She was included in the now legendary Freeze exhibition in 1988, curated by her friend and sometime collaborator Damien Hurst. But it wasn't until a couple of years after that that she found what would become her language, taking everyday objects and presenting them in a brutally matter-of-fact way to acknowledge societal and cultural conventions, quirks and inequities. Among the first works in this manner were a series of blown-up spreads from British tabloid newspapers like The Sunday Sport, with misogynistic stories like Sod You Gits from 1990, which sexually othered a small person. She'd been immersed in the feminist writings of Andrea Dworkin and saw that simply presenting misogyny on a grand scale with little comment was enough to to provoke an array of responses from viewers. Sarah has said in an interview with the art newspaper's Louisa Buck that the tabloids were the beginning of me as we know me. A remarkably bold series of works then followed. Among them was Two Fried Eggs and a Kebab from 1982, in which the titular foodstuffs are slapped on a table to form the most sardonic of reclining nudes. That work and the tabloid spreads were included in the second of Charles Saatchi's Young British Artists exhibitions, which helped name the movement. He also acquired Au Naturel, a soiled mattress with sewn-in lewd objects, melons and a bucket for her, oranges and a cucumber for him, which featured in the infamous Sensation Show in 1990 at the Royal Academy, one of the defining moments in the YBA story. Another was the shop, the anarchic premises Sarah and Tracy Emin ran on the Bethnal Green Road in the East End of London in 1993. Also characterising this early period were her self-portrait photographs, which reflect the open meanings of much of her work. Sarah plays on her androgynous appearance, adopting blokish attitudes while also reflecting a certain vulnerability. Many of the images feature the kind of deadpan sexual puns that permeate her work. She eats a banana, she holds a fish over her shoulder, she sits with a skull between her legs and with eggs over her breasts. Few objects that Lucas uses are without metaphorical significance. Lights begin to enter her work dramatically in the late 1990s, often penetrating furniture, as in Donkey Kong Diddle Eye of 2000, a leather sofa with round lamps signifying breasts and a fluorescent strip light evoking a penis. Cigarettes too have a phallic significance, but are also a symbol of pleasure and destruction through Sarah's work. She's used them to neatly decorate all manner of objects, including a sculpture of the crucifixion on an English St George flag, and the bonnet, wings and seats of a partly burnt out car in this Jaguar's going to heaven from 2018. For all the amusement inherent in Sarah's work, it's never far from disquiet and anxiety. Among the works that best encapsulate the myriad moods and meanings with which she can imbue her sculptures are the bunnies. They began with a single work called Bunny in 1997, in which Sarah almost by accident formed a body emerging from a chair by draping tan tights over its back, stuffing the legs with kapok, using wire to add more definition, and then adding a pair of black stockings on its legs. The title is partly a reference to Playboy Bunnies, whose stereotypical image of women is the antithesis of Sarah's sculpture, but also to the drooping rabbit 
ear-like shapes fashioned from another pair of tights at the top of the piece. Bunny was immediately a kind of latter-day surrealist object, potent yet abject, funny yet tragic. Sarah's built an extraordinary body of work from that initial starting point over the past quarter of a century. The series Nuds featured coiled, bodily, stuffed nylon forms seemingly riffing on modernist sculpture presented on concrete breeze blocks and she's pushed those and the bunnies into rich territories. Now sometimes cast in concrete, resin and bronze, the bunnies continue to wrap around, cavort on, lurk within or burst out of the furniture, at once vulnerable, exploited, libidinous and defiant, often within one sculpture depending upon where you're looking from. The chairs too are sometimes found, sometimes made, many of them concrete casts. There's a wonderful sculptural fluidity about the bunny series, one that takes an abstract delight in form and material despite the clearly figurative outcomes of her experiments. Indeed, among the most impressive elements of Sarah's work is her ability to fluidly move along the line between form and content, figuration and abstraction. Her muses are plaster casts of the lower halves of naked bodies, including her own, resting or sitting on found or cast furniture and objects. Created collaboratively with the friends they depict, they're as tender as Lucas gets, yet they're still resolutely tough and unsentimental. They have cigarettes sticking out of their orifices. Though she now lives between London and the quiet and bucolic countryside in Suffolk in eastern England, where she's collaborated on works with her partner Julian Simmons, Sarah has remained noisily uncompromising in her work. She continues to resist standard approaches to materials and to exhibition making. This has been a common factor since early in her career but has taken dramatic new forms since her 2004 Tate Britain show with Damien Hirst and Angus Fairhurst called Inagada de Vida and it's this radical approach to museum shows with which I began our conversation. We met at Tate Britain just as she had completed installing another major show there, this time a solo exhibition called Happy Gas but she's eschewed the chance to present a conventional retrospective, instead choosing an idiosyncratic route through her work based on one of her perennial motifs. So I asked her, what lies behind this urge to forego orthodoxy? Hmm, I hadn't thought about it like that. Actually, it's a survey because it's a survey of chairs in my work. (laughs) It's a survey of chairs. It still goes back to the beginning and right up to now. To tell you the truth, it's not even exhaustive on chairs in my work. But it certainly isn't exhaustive of all the types of things I've done. Absolutely. And what struck me when walking around is how extraordinarily broad your use of chairs has been over the years. Mm. Sometimes it's extremely matter of fact. Sometimes you're puncturing them, penetrating them with all kinds of objects. Then you're casting some in concrete and so on. It seems like there's a sort of sense in which the chair as an object is a sort of leap for the imagination, you can, you can do all manner of things to it and, and there's no kind of rules about how you use them in the work. No. Well, I mean, the thing is, quite a lot of shows I do around the world, <laughs> I'm making an element of those shows at the actual place. I go, I go for longer and have a longer period of time in the place. So sometimes I make the entire show that way. Sometimes I take certain things and make some there. But I often go around looking at, for furniture and not necessarily chairs or just looking for what's around, cars, whatever it might be, the things I can get in somewhere there, you know. And, I mean, chairs have their own character anyway, but, I mean, different cultures have their own character. So, you know, I just sort of choose promising, well, in this case, chairs. And there's all kinds of ways in which they have different characters, and that's quite suggestive of what you might do with them. And in terms of their symbolism, it's that richness that you can conjure from them as well. You've talked about how they can be as sort of humdrum as being used to prop up a door or, or, yeah. or, or change a light bulb, but also mm. they're sites for sex. They're things that basically people sit and rot in. So there's a tremendous scope for meaning in there. Oh, definitely. And I mean, everything's like that. All objects are like that. I like using real things. I like the fact they already have a reality of their own. I like using used things because they seem to have some of that feeling of how they've lived their life already about them. And even if you're casting a chair in concrete or something... All those um, idiosyncrasies and maybe scuzzed up bits and creases were from use make that extra interesting than just going and buying a brand new chair or something. And that brings me to this really interesting aspect of your work, which is the sort of idea of character. I'm really intrigued that in the catalogue, Lauren Elkin tells this story that she texts you an image of one of your bunnies and you refer to it when you reply as she oh yeah and this is this really interesting thing that they have characters they are Mm. lent genders 
and the chairs amplify that too they have certain characters so it's objects the bodies that you build with them and so on mm. there's a sort of redolent character within the thing and then you build on that and develop it well the character sort of emerges i don't make up my mind always which is going to be and it doesn't always come down to whether they've got tits or a knob or something <laughs> like there's a sculpture downstairs in the pink room the peach colored room it's a bronze on a concrete chair with lots and lots of sort of tits but to me, that's a he. In fact, it's Casanova. Right. Um, sometimes I'm making something that starts to remind me of somebody. It could be a personal friend or a character from history. Or at a certain point, I start to recognise something about it that rings a bell with me. And that also informs what, what sex they become. Or some of them are actually quite androgynous. And I don't really expect other people to have to make up their mind. It could be whatever they like to them. But um, anyway, that's how it goes for me. Yeah. But it, the interesting thing to me looking at the bunnies is... In the round, they can change that character. So on the one hand, they might look submissive, but you might walk around the sculpture and suddenly there's an element of threat or defiance or whatever. Mm. Obviously, that's about sculpture. It's about three dimensions. But is that an important thing to you? It's not just an image, in other words. It's, it's much more rich than that. You can have multiple meanings within one figure. Yeah, something I've started to like, and it applies very much to the new bunnies, let's call them, is to have a muse. So for the, for the new bunnies in this show, the most recent ones, there's two muses. They're on various different chairs. Some of those chairs are on, both of them are on in different occasions and, um, you know, striking up different poses. Obviously, I change them a bit if needs be, because when you put them on a different chair, it moves about where their flesh is and stuff. That fluid thing of working in that way and that then that they can change their attitude the same as you can get a bloody bad mood on one morning or... <laughs> it's a good thing about using a material like the tights with the wire and everything. It's, it's something I can be, be very, very ready with, just get stuck into, and I can keep changing it. Uh, this time when I made the new ones, I had the pangolin, because normally I'd, I'd take a couple of sculptures to pangolin and get them scanned in to get the digital information to make, to make them hard. But this last, well, it actually was at least a year and a half ago that they came to do that longer, I think. I've been working on them for two years. Right. But they've now got this mobile unit which can come to me and do it. And that was really brilliant because um, partly uh, well, it just suited me really well because I had six ready to go when they came as he started scanning them. And it's quite a long process of scanning, much longer than the making of them. So right. <laughs> anyway, once he'd finished with one, I could then just completely change that into another one. Because I always think about the casting process. It's such an unspontaneous process. And I'm sort of trying to make inroads into keeping more life in, in that process. So that's starting at the very beginning to just put a bit more spontaneity into the process. And then there's the sort of mixing up of materials and all that sort of thing and bringing colour into it and not sticking to literal just translation into bronze kind of thing. Right. And it's so interesting what you said about bronze in the past. You said the same about oil paint, that you kind of resisted those things because that was what art was. Yeah. <laughs> was it about a sort of not wanting to be pulled into orthodoxy or convention in some way? Or was it somehow dishonest, in a way, to use those kind of materials? I had this idea that it's important that you can make art out of anything and that anybody can do it. And even if you're in the most minimal circumstances, if you're in the desert, you can still do something, you can still use the sand or scratch your name in it. Or It's mostly an imaginative thing that you're doing. Obviously, it also has a physical side if you're going to make an object or something like that. And that you can still do something really good that really cuts the mustard. To yourself, first and foremost, because it always is yourself, first and foremost. You're your first audience, if you like. And something about that, that sort of attitude and principle, I suppose I've held on to. And it literally is, you make a lot of work on your kitchen table in your lap and so on. Yeah, right? or wherever I am, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> on the hop. But it struck me there's this really nice phrase that you use, that when you started making art, you wanted to have time on your own. And it strikes me you've maintained that. Not necessarily on my own, but sometimes on my own. I wanted my time to be my own. Yeah. I mean, even before I went to art college or knew that this, this is what I was going to be doing, that was something that I wanted, to have a certain amount of time, room in my life for all the things I really like doing, knocking about, reading, you know, anything that I like doing. I, I, when I used to have to have jobs to bring in a bit of money, I used to try and keep them to the fewest days of week possible so that I'd be free the other days, that kind of thing. And actually, I would say on those terms, I've been quite successful. <laughs> Does a lot of your work in that sense happen in your head as well as with your hands, if you know what I mean? A lot of thinking time as well as doing time. Well, it's a mixture of both, but I'm not necessarily sitting down ostensibly to think about what I might make. Whereas I often am sitting down thinking, right, I'm going to make something now, I'm going to get on with something. But I, I have a sort of climate of ideas going, which is partly from reading or music or certain atmosphere of the times or things that have been on my mind about what's going on or, you know, there's a climate of ideas and 
then you start making something and at some point they start to come together more or find which bits of each other that they need to be what they're going to be you know right and that speaks to the informality of the exhibition making to me in in that sense that the plinths are up for grabs the floor is up for grabs the (laughs) the wallpaper and so on In, in other words that idea that an exhibition looks a certain way does in the same way as art has to be made of bronze or oil paint. Yeah. It's, it's there to be challenged, in other words. Well, I mean, I just want to make a good show, but I also want to make a new show. If I'm doing a show, I don't want to do some version of the show I did last time. Likewise with making the work, I was always a bit wary because I could see this happening so much around me. But for start, because people get pigeonholed. It's not always that what their intention was. The last thing I ever wanted to do with art was turn it into a business or a job. I mean, I'm actually, I'm not a very good um, scholar and I didn't have that kind of education, but I love reading and things like that. I often think I'm probably really misunderstanding a lot of stuff I read, but it's not entirely the point because I get such a lot of stimulation from it and I I enjoy it. And a lot of people say, oh, I wish I could read more books. I don't know why they bother to feel like that. And the reason they don't, I think, is because they found it so dreary when they had to study. So I never wanted to turn it into that. I do it because I like to do it. In terms of the way that work progressed... It seems to me that there's this really interesting thing that you had a a moment in 1990 where you started working with the newspaper spreads. Mm. And you've talked about that as a kind of fork in the road where you were very interested in abstraction even then. And you'd come from a place of abstraction when you were goldsmiths and so on. Mm. But it seems to me that the abstraction is absolutely still there. Yeah, because it has to be. I mean, it was whatever you're making, it has a formal exercise on one level. That tends to get overlooked a lot. But not by me, but by people talking about my work because they get more interested in the obvious sort of contents or the sexuality or that, those kinds of things. The success of the piece still relies on those formal qualities, but they don't get talked about so much. Right. I find, you know. Is it more evident, do you think, when you use things like colour? Because I've noticed that the bunnies have got extremely colourful at certain mm. points. There's still a kind of spareness and a kind of austerity to lots of them but there's that sort of poppy color at times yeah well i think that's partly why i wanted to use the color but it was mainly because i just really like color and people think i use such a pared down palette but that was because i was very much like the colors that things already have i like their reality so i didn't want to jeopardize their reality but it becomes another one of these rules you want to break out of at a certain point i suppose I know you've talked about how with exhibitions you like to bring existing works into conversation, if you like, with newer works. Yeah. In, in a way to kind of reinvent them. So it seems to me that the works are never finished in your mind, in a way. In a way, they're not. In a way, they're very much in progress because you can always take a different view of them or, or put them in a different conversation. But the thing about an exhibition is it's a new work in itself. It's sort of a temporary one, I suppose. So people better come and see it while they can because you know for a fact it ne- those, that group of things will never be together again and... And even if they were, they wouldn't be in the same circumstances. You know, it's just like a, it's a moment in time. And in that sense, it is a kind of theatrical thing. You know, it's like, how do you want to present it this time? And that, and that's the new fresh thing. If it was just a case of presenting old works again, the same ones, it would be very dreary occupation. It would, you know, I wouldn't want to do it here. (laughs) For instance, in the first room of the Tate Britain exhibition that we have now, you've got a work from like the very early stages, the Mm. old couple. And then within sight of that, there's a work called Wanker, which is the hydraulic wanking arms. You suddenly see different spectatorial relationships between yeah. the sculptors. Like we were saying earlier on the characters, but they are almost talking. Like There's formal associations, but there's also kind of character associations. Well, I like. mean, even for me making them, and even, when, even over periods of years, one type of sculpture is reacting to another type. So that conversation has already gone on to some extent, on, on a certain level, with me. And there's never just one story or one angle or one opinion or one meaning. So to actually be able to show a bit more of those sides is exciting, exciting for me. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? I'm not a big heroes person at all, never have been for somebody. I've got a huge amount of um, indifference to a lot of stuff in life, actually. I'm, it's, a, it's probably a, a failing of mine, but I just... In early college years, I, I liked Eva Hess, I suppose. Be, right. You know, that responded to that, I seem to remember. That sort of fluency she had with materials and the ability to move yeah, between Yeah, and, and I suppose it was, when I first went to Goldsmiths, it was a sort of awakening in me of the, how much I did feel about materials which I sort of, because before that, I didn't really know which way I was going to go, whether I wanted to have a bash at painting, and I'd done a bit more of that at evening classes and stuff. And the goldsmith was really the sort of awakening to materials in a way. 
You were on the sculpture course there. Is it right that lots of you were on that course because, in a way, you were freer? Because well, you could actually, kind of choose whatever you, you wanted. You, you didn't have to be... I mean, I got put in the sculpture group, but it doesn't really mean anything like that. It just meant what type of studio you got. But actually, there was no syllabus at Goldsmiths. You didn't have to choose between disciplines, and there was no actual structure to the teaching either. It was just a kind of social thing, mostly, that you could talk to some whoever was there if you wanted to, to say, can I have a chat with you later on or something? And that was it, really. And, and people came and gave lectures and stuff like that. But it was really good, but it was very uh, open. I always saw in your work that sort of wonderful informality that I see in some of Richard Wentworth's sculpture, and I know he was one of your Mm. tutors, and I sort of think about that that sort of making do and getting by, you know, those things. Mm. I I wonder, did he help encourage that sort of attitude to the material? I think he did. You know, I'm still in touch with him often about just those kinds of things, funny pictures we might take in the street of something propping something else up, or, you know, um, it's a conversation that never totally ran out of steam. Yeah, yeah, he did. One of the reasons that this is an interesting question in terms of artists that you first discovered, it seems to me you discovered art before you discovered artists, in a way, through making. Through well, that, that, I'd that always been of... making things, and my parents were very handy in a sort of DIY and crafts, making your own clothes and curtains and bloody building shelves and knocking things up. And actually, they both dabbled a little bit in... Well, my mum did a lot of embroidery. My dad did a little bit of painting and wrote a bit of poetry and stuff so I was quite used to doing things but I wasn't aware of contemporary art world stuff or right. anything, really and I'm not even historical art world stuff much either actually but um, but it was sort of suggested to you that you might have a kind of interest in making art and you went to evening classes and so well, on I left school so. when I was 16 but when I was about 18 I met a woman at a job I had who had been to St Martin's and we got on quite well and she said you'd really like art college and I was sort of wondering what I was really going to do with next, not even with my life, but next. And I thought, yeah, that sounds good then. Um, and then I started doing the evening classes. So I, she, I said, well, you know, how do you do it? And she said, well, you know, you've got to get a portfolio together. So I started going to all sorts of evening classes, and that was good. The interesting thing about that sort of period is that whenever I talk to artists who were art school then and in the 90s when I went, the idea that you could make a living as an artist or, or yeah. become an artist... I mean, nobody was... thought that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wonderful chance to just do stuff right and to find do something out. interesting and to meet other interesting people and to yeah it was just an adventure which historical artist do you turn to the most today i'm not big on artists to be honest i'm not against anyone or anything but um i don't get most of my stimulation from looking at other art i, I like reading a lot and i like the world i've got really slack about it is the truth you know as a younger artist at college and when i used to be going to openings all the time I'd be around on the art scene much more. And over recent years, I've done less and less of that, partly not living in London. Partly, whenever I go to art events, I meet so many people that I sort of know, but I can't remember who they know. <laughs> it makes me so self-conscious. You know, I've sort of drifted away from being very involved in the art stuff going on and reverted to the type, which is bookish. Right. It seems to me that the fact that you don't have heroes means that your work comes into very, very productive relationships with historic art. So that show well, that you I did mean, in San Francisco where your work was directly in correspondence with Rodin, mm. I didn't see the show, but the pictures, it's extraordinary. Yeah, that was nice. There's another thing about me, I've got mixed feelings about almost everything. I'm sort of on a pendulum. or I've got at least one point of view about everything. So it's not like I, I'm not consistent in that way, which is, I suppose, another thing about not having heroes. But, the, I mean, the thing about influence is, obviously I'm influenced by things, especially unconsciously and by the work. We're all a product of hidden forces but certainly I do take note of certain things at certain times from different artists but they they sort of come and go if I see anything that's useful in another artist historical or otherwise I'll take something from it I'm not trying to deny having any influences but I wouldn't want to point to one person no so you won't so walk walk around with a sketchbook and make a drawing directly no I don't I don't do any of that sort of thing yeah yeah going back to this idea of having shows alongside historic artists. There was an amazing show that you did with Gelatin oh, where yeah. you were put in direct contact with Bosch. Oh, yeah. And, um, well, that was their gig and they asked me if I wanted to do it with them. And I was very happy to because it's really fun hanging out with them. And that was really good. They had this it's quite a fancy museum and actually, and obviously they have to have all these uh, climate control rooms and stuff because of the quality of the old masters they've got there and everything. But anyway, this guy, Peter Wipplinger, who was the director at the time. This is Kunsthalle Krems, right? Yeah, and Krems is brilliant medieval town, but two of the Jersey guys actually are from that town. And it's like a sort of 
Hansel and Gretel place, <laughs> right on the Danube. Anyway, there was a budget for this show, and they had the idea, which is very typical of them. Let's take the whole budget, and instead of spending it on shipping over works, we'll take three weeks and we'll make the whole show there. And so that's what we did, and Hans said, yes, it's fine. And so they closed down half the museum and let us use it as a studio for three weeks, and we all moved into this house over the road. And they brought about 20 other useful guys to help. It was like the circus. <laughs> it really was. And we just knocked up this show. It was so brilliant. It was so much fun. And that speaks to that informality that we were talking about earlier yeah. on. And it's difficult to have that <laughs> Informality in museums, right? is, is quite a key thing. And even in the artworks itself, I take for mind, it's the uh, assemblage thing is, it's almost a difficult thing to hang on to, to be both formal and casual. And that's been, those things have been quite important to me uh, to sort of try and keep somehow. Yeah, I guess it's quite difficult when you're getting offers from museums. There is that you're yeah, on and that there's, and there's that expe- like. expectation on things, and it's sort of tempting to try and address that with foolproof things. Right, but it's the foolproof things that always go wrong somehow, and, and it's the other things that happen that tend to have more life in them. I, I find it seemed to me that that was really important in the series of shows you did called Situation. Yeah. I that love was all on that shows. principle, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it seemed, because it was really interesting, because Damien Hurst was having a big retrospective at Take Modern at that time, and the contrast between those experiences, it struck me, mm. was really instructive. Mm. In the sense that there were you doing monthly, kind of really informal, anarchic at times, you know, performances and so on. Mm. It felt really kind of like liberating. From, yeah, from I enjoyed spectator's it. spectator's point of view. Yeah, it was good. It was a good year. And did it almost set the path for where you went from there as well? Almost kind See, of like- a lot of things that I use now, like things like the wallpaper started in situation. I mean, when you're thinking on your feet and just making, and you, and you, you have to do it then and there, like, you've, you know, so I've said I'll go to Mexico and make a show, for instance, and I've got X amount of time. And, you know, you haven't got the time to deliberate too much or have too much hesitation. You have to accept a lot more things. And you have to accept things like the differences in the materials there. Even blocks vary so much. I mean, as in Mexico, I used Adobe blocks and they were beautiful. Wonderful. Quite crumbly, but, but they're beautiful, sort of golden colour. So this was that kind of adventure. And it, throw, and it does throw up a lot of things. I actually get a lot of my tights still from Mexico because they're just a bit heavier duty than the tights in Europe. <laughs> Which here. seems counterintuitive, right? I mean, you think they'd be lighter. <laughs> I know, but everything's a bit heavier duty in Mexico, actually, weirdly <laughs> enough. So some things like that stick. Anyway, it's nice to improvise. It's, I like it a lot. And, it, and that, again, puts a lot of energy into those particular shows. You know, it's not like being super seriously presenting these things that you're very, very sure about and have got this meaning already established in the world or something like that. It's still a, a living thing. And that was a kind it seems again that there was an evolution of a body of work in that show because you did with Gelatin, you did made a work called Father Time and there you had oh, yeah, that the very high colour, bright that. pink blocks with that. the They nuts. were doing yeah. such sort of big things and I can't remember what exactly prompted the idea. Probably seeing, we have gone to the DIY place and I'd seen these big pink slabs, rectangular slabs and I thought, well, quite fancy doing something with them. I think they were doing this great big enormous thing that took up this whole major room, great big long tree thing and I sort of wanted to get them at it a bit, partly. <laughs> <laughs> a Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 250 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Among the most recent additions to the app are two guides that reflect its increasing range of international institutions, the Georg Kolbe Museum in Berlin and the Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong. Among the other guides on Bloomberg Connects is Tate, whose four UK galleries include Tate Liverpool, where Sarah Lucas had a show in 2005, and Tate Britain, where her survey is taking place in autumn 2023. There are also guides to several other museums and galleries where she's had important shows, including the Whitechapel Gallery in London and the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. Download the app and you'll discover that the guide to the Hammer has features on its collection and temporary exhibitions, including Sanford Biggers' remarkable sculpture, Oracle, which the artist discusses in depth across several audio features. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. I'm not going to ask you to name contemporary artists you most admire. I'm going to suggest them to you because I can see that it's worth doing it that way. Gelatin came out of your relationship with Franz Vest. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Were you a Franz Vest admirer, if you like, before? I'd only really just come across him. He did that thing in a high park with the great big long sausage-like colour things. Yeah. 
And I thought, oh, that looks interesting. <laughs> but funny enough, he started to invite me to be in shows with him. And I thought, I thought that was a bit weird. I thought it was probably after my ideas or something. Because that's the kind of thing you think when you're that age, I think. You know, <laughs> you think you're in weirdly, weirdly well, this been 1990s or early 2000s. A naivety that young people have, yeah. Um, but anyway, I said yes. And then that was a really brilliant experience because I, I was in quite a lot of group shows that he did and he liked to collaborate. And the brilliant thing about him was he, he always suggested what he wanted to do. He didn't suggest that what he wanted in the first place. And he actually was very, very brilliant at improvising, putting together an exhibition. He was amazing because he could have the most disparate, weird bunch of stuff and he somehow he'd make it look elegant and sublime and sing. I remember when Franz died and thinking, oh, right, well, Franz is dead. It's time to be dad yourself, you know. And I've tried to grow into that. I actually feel like I am getting quite confident about making these improvised kind of installations now, but I, I definitely would earmark Franz for that notion. And there's a sculpture from 2018, which is called Dickhead. Oh, yeah. And it seems to me that the giant red phallus in that work is maybe an homage to Franz, or it's a Vestian form. It's got that thing that he would do of just slap some paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's a great deep red This, this will yeah. be good pink. <laughs> he likes certain colours. Um, and, and there are certain colours he didn't like. He said, no, I don't like that. It's a too, too, too greenish. <laughs> <laughs> so you learned, in a way, you kind of, by seeing him operate, it gave you confidence to push your own practice, or especially exhibition-making well, practice yeah, in a Well, yeah, and direction. I mean, I've always been quite a cooperative sort of person. I like other people. And he was very much that way. So it, it helped along that path, I suppose, yeah. And it must have been an amazing invitation then when you got the chance to design the kind of yeah, structures for the Franz really Show loved, Tate Modern. I really loved doing that and because it was a chance to spend a bit of time with him in a, in a weird way, even though he wasn't literally there. But he was, you know, it was, yeah. that was funny. Yeah, it was nice. And those structures that you created, the furniture, the, the partitions and so on, they're very much in your Tate Britain show. Yeah, well, I'd done the first for the uh, Whitechapel show, but with blocks, not with the sheet concrete. Yeah. And when it came to doing the Franz West thing, the freestanding walls that we wanted were so big. I think it might have been one of the techs there who said, what about doing it with concrete sheets? I can't remember. You never know who, who comes up with these things. I mean, I remember actually doing the freestanding walls for the Whitechapel was the idea of Roddy Thompson, who makes a lot of plinths for me. And, actually, and Roddy and Tim are plinths, and they've been friends of mine for years, and they've made it actually all the stuff for the shop here. The right. furniture. And when I first started making the modular furniture, I was doing it with them. And uh, Roddy had the idea, it would be quite good to do just a, a freestanding wall. And I wanted something to break up the space, which I'd kept open at Whitechapel. So we did that. And it was great, but it's quite complicated and super, super, super heavy. So when this idea emerged of using the concrete sheets, we thought, well, yeah, okay, we'll give that a go. And of course, they turned out to be much better than I expected because they've got this kind of pattern that puts really a lot of energy into them and looks quite painterly, I think. But that's the first time I've ever done it here, like right up to the, yeah. not as a freestanding wall. And I think it makes the place seem taller. The big blow ups and the, and the walls, because partly because they're vertical stripes, really make the space feel more elevated. Yeah, sort of area somehow. Yeah. yeah. But it seems to me that that's a concern generally in, in, in many of your shows. It was true mm. of Inagada de Vida that you did with Damien and, and Angus here too. It's true of the White Chapel that you want to open up exhibitions as opposed to having series of, of, I don't quite like, defined I ways. don't like, building loads of structures inside, really. I mean, obviously, we've, we've divided this up. It's not completely open. No. You have to decide where you want your modules. But I don't like it boxes or four ceilings or completely dark spaces. That, I, I like to see what you're in and have the feeling of whatever's good about the space that is at its maximum. Louise Bourgeois is another artist who a lot of people have spotted lurking somewhere in your work. Is there a particular body of work that you've responded to of hers? Do you recognise her as a kind of forebear in a way I wouldn't go so far as to say forebear but I but I liked her um, figures that are sort of made of sandbags almost and her use of the soft materials actually I suppose that gave me a certain amount of license because you know it does help to have precedence for things sometimes to think well okay when you when you see something unorthodox in a museum you think you think oh well that's good then <laughs> yeah I mean Klaus Erdenberg you could say a similar thing and use it making big cardboard things and stuff like that and, of course, there's the iconic kind of picture of her with the big knob under her yeah. arm. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, the thing about... I think that, it's a good look for an old lady. It, well, yeah, absolutely. But also that sort of thing about her in the sense that you got a sense that she was profoundly analytical. She obviously went through psychoanalysis and was therefore deeply knowledgeable about that experience and that kind of culture. Mm. 
But also there was a sort of positivity and, again, a kind of freed imagination mm. that allowed her to take on board all sorts of interesting associations but not be kind of defined by them in a way. Mm. And it seems to me that that's common to your work as well, that you, you talk about how you read a lot. That you've, there's Andrea Dworkin's feminist writings there right from the start in the early works, but you don't feel tethered to them, if you know what I mean. Well, it'd be nice not to ever get tethered to anything, wouldn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> No, I try and stay open, me. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to also talk about Yoko Ono because I know that there's a work called Honey Pie. Mm. And I know you've talked about how she was a kind of muse for some of these bunnies. Yeah, I did two shows. They actually opened just before the lockdown in the early part of um, 2020, I suppose. Yeah, it was, yeah. One was in New York, Barbara Gladstone's, and one was here in Sadie Coles. They were just a week apart, and they were more or less the same show. In they had a sort of a bronze concrete component, and that was the same in both shows, apart from a little bit of paint job here and there on, on Dickhead's knob. Um, <laughs> but the colour bunnies, the tights ones, were different in both cases. But both shows were called Honey Pie. I decided on sides because I was just listening to a lot of Yoko Ono at the time, and it set up a certain atmosphere, and some of the songs were really, really funny. I did borrow some other titles for a bit, like uh, Cool Trick Baby and stuff from, yeah. from Yoko Ono. It's quite nice to get into a certain zone when you're making a body of work. And in that case, it was Yoko Ono, but also I love revisiting the Beatles. So a lot of that kind of stuff crept in as a sort of vibration to those works at that moment. It seems to me just hearing you talk, it's like a lot of it is about the attitude. Like, so with Franz Vest, it was his attitude with Yoko, it's yeah. the attitude. It's mm. kind of like a, almost not a not moral position, but a kind of... Yeah. Well, it's very, very difficult to describe these kind of things, but it's, it's where you think, where does art live? And it lives somewhere between a person looking at it or a person making it and the actual object itself and what that's going to be. And there's a sort of cloud of ideas around when you're making something that you pull things out of to, until they sort of go together. But obviously there's a lot of ideas that then just blow away that you can't actually pinpoint them in the, in the work. But I think they do sometimes, they do sometimes lend objects of kind of artworks, let's say, a transcendent quality because you can sense, that's what you're trying to say about Louis Bourgeois in a way, that you can sense that almost intelligence or awareness in the things because somehow it's there, even though you can't trace and I can't remember everything I thought when I was doing that. <laughs> but that is a part of it getting made. And then I think when people come and look at artworks, they also feel that they're being looked at by the artwork a bit. It's a self-conscious experience. And that's, I think, what it should be. You know, I hate to put words in people's mouth or thoughts in their head about what they should think when they look at it, because it's not really about that. It's about what they do think, which is also going to be dependent to what they bring to it. It's an animating factor, in other words, for the audience. Yeah, and for me in the making process. But it's interesting how formal decisions can lead to meaning, right? You don't prescribe the meaning before you set about making it, that through the making, through putting together materials and colours and so mm. on, meaning can emerge, yeah, and thinking about titles, but thinking about titles is often to do with what I'm reading or listening to music or and all sorts of random stuff. Somebody might say that I overhear or something I see on the telly and it might just stick for a moment. I do keep a sort of list of A, things that I'm sort of seem relevant to the mood I'm after and B, funny phrases and things like that. And then, you know, some of them get discarded and some of them stick and sometimes at a certain point they move around from one sculpture to another one because that one becomes more like that than that one was. And, you know, it's a fluid sort of thing. I love that. One of the things that being part of a very famous movement within a particular culture and a particular country provokes is a kind of association forever with a kind of movement as in yeah. the artist but it strikes me we talked about gelatin we talked about Franz Vest we talked about Louise Bourgeois one of the things that your work has done perhaps the way you've shown and the way that you've gone about your career since the, that sort of 90s moment is that there are all sorts of associations with international and European artists that seem much more pertinent now mm. than perhaps the associations with that group of artists that with well, in the way they did then and even yeah. with those artists that, with whom I was pigeonholed because we took a lot of our influences from what was going on in New York and what was going on in Cologne and Germany. When we were emerging, that was where the action was. So, you know, we're, we were all influenced by that. Let's talk about your studio, because I know that you work a lot at home, but you have had studios at certain points. Do you have stuff around you other than the materials for the work? Are you, have you got images around you? And no. Other people, <laughs> people always want to come and do studio visits, and I say, well, there's nothing to see, but they don't believe me. But there really isn't. <laughs> So basically, there's the work, 
and then there's space. I mean, this is actually a principle that I sort of started to have when I was very young. I thought I never want to have been more than I can put in a suitcase, and I haven't managed that. But um, <laughs> but I do like to keep things down. I hate clutter. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. I'm even making objects in a way because it does clutter you up, especially when you're working at home. Which is why, more recently, I've actually had a studio because I used to have to spend a bit of time making stuff, get the whole place cluttered up, then ship them out to wherever they're going and get rid of everything again. So have a moment, so a period of peace. <laughs> <laughs> but then it, it, having that sort of set up, then it, that's why it's so important that you can have a kind of casting mechanism, which is coming to you and not having to store vast amounts of... Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't do any of that. I can't bear it. It just depressed me so much. But it also goes back to that principle of... of um, you can do things anywhere with anything with whatever you've got on you. And there's a very real sense in which precisely what any of us is as an individual is what we've got on us, what we've really got on us. The bits that can't be taken away that don't exist as stuff or possessions or something like that, that is actually something that you can improvise because it's what you are. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? Um, I've been to Colchester a lot lately. <laughs> <laughs> First sight, mainly because I was coming and going from the big women exhibition that I did there, which was yeah. brilliant, brilliant fun to do. And the last couple of weeks I've visited here quite a bit, <laughs> like every day, <laughs> all day. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose this is probably blasphemous to some people, but there's a church, I understand, in Framlingham that you've used as a kind of site. There are these lions in St Michael's Church in oh, Framlingham. Yeah. You, it's almost kind of a museum, a, a, a space for work. Well, no, that's for... just a very historic church and it's right opposite my studio. I mean, there's a castle at the top of the road as well, which is also a very historic place. But yeah, there's got, they've got these amazing tombs from sort of Tudor times. But two of the tombs have got lions on the, all four corners and the lions have got still got their knobs and bollocks intact, which is kind of amazing they even had knobs and bollocks in the first place. <laughs> but even more amazing, they didn't get knocked off during the iconoclasm kind of stuff, reformation. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it made me think... When I was looking at your tit toms, which are these little cats that appear yeah, downstairs. Yeah, yeah, they may be they, something but, to that. <laughs> so they still got, and there's a picture in the catalogue, in fact, of the, the rear of one of the tit toms with bollocks intact. And <laughs> I tell you another funny thing. Since I made the, the tit tom, a couple of tom cats have come to live in my garden. They were my neighbours who died, but they just came since then. I thought, oh, that's funny. Now I've actually got a couple living in the garden. A self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe. <laughs> um, which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? The way I see the world probably changes a lot all the time. I couldn't pin that down. I don't, I don't even think about cultural experiences. I'm not saying I don't have them. I'm just saying I don't <laughs> think about them. What about visiting Mexico? Because you've talked about Mexico a bit already, but it seems like quite transformative in all sorts of ways, the, not just in terms of the tights, but in terms of the materials, but also spaces that you're Yeah, Mexico to. has been amazing, the exhibitions I've done there. The first one I did was in Anahuac Alley, which is a big sort of volcanic-seeming edifice built by Diego Rivera yeah. as his studio, and he also intended to be his tomb, and he lived there, and it's all built out of volcanic rock. And it's really, really dark, and it has kind of slit windows with marble in which is somehow transparent that the light comes through and some of them just don't have any window but it's really quite a dark place and he also built it to house his collection of ancient mexican artifacts so it's full of those guys and they um they were very inspiring I, there's some magic happens in mexico things get under your skin and that was particularly true in anuakali actually i made the red sky pictures that are in this show for mexico i didn't make them in mexico but they were they were for a show i was doing in mexico because I always do have that real sort of under the volcano feeling in Mexico. And somehow it gives rise to this tremendous energy for things to get done and things to happen, happenings particularly. Yeah. And, and you described those images as kind of hellish. Uh, apocalyptic. This kind of, yeah, apocalyptic. They've got sort of that very deep red background and the smoke and everything else. Mm. And there's a, there's a sort of turmoil to them. Is it right they were made by sort of spinning you around on a chair with a cigarette, basically? And Julian took the photographs very quickly. He had it on a very slow shutter speed, so I was moving quicker than the than the shutter speed, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so you have this kind of blurry, kind of woozy kind of feel yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah, that seemed to be perfect for Mexico. But when I showed them in Mexico, actually, I showed them as a set of prints, framed up. So it's the first time I've shown them like this, and I think it works even better as a sort of sequence, almost like a film sequence or something. Let's talk about literature. Are there any writers or poets that you return to? 
Yeah, to too many, really, to even bloody state. I mean, I, I read a lot of things once, and I, I suppose there are things that I go back to, but different times in my life. I was intrigued to see that you were reading lots of what seemed to me to be quite like almost apocalyptic. You mentioned apocalyptic there, books about surveillance capitalism, oh, for yeah. instance, and, and uh, Jeanette Winterson's book about AI and stuff yeah. like that. What was interesting to me about that was that uh, about to what extent reading is a kind of informing activity. Oh, in totally, yeah. And I mean, I'm not a very techno person. I'm, re- I'm actually the world's worst. I'm like such an old lady about it. But I'd want to understand what's going on. So, yeah, I do read a lot of stuff to understand what's going on. I mean, actually, yes, you're right. I've got a whole section of books that I put downstairs that I chose, but I couldn't tell you what they are. I can't read them off like a list now. Because no, of course. My memory doesn't work like that anymore. But anyone who wants to check that out is down there in the bloody in, in shop. In Tate Britain's shop right now. <laughs> but I suppose the interesting thing about that to me is that the political engagement of your work has long been reported, particularly within the context of feminism. But it seems mm. to me, it's a, of course, feminism is there, but it's a humanism as well. There is oh, totally. A, Totally. I mean, I'm not a sexist particularly. I never was. It's about people, isn't it, and what's going on. And it's the same with the meaning thing. I'm not trying to make things with one meaning. I don't have one message. If I'd had one message that I wanted to say, I would just say it, wouldn't I? I wouldn't bother making the thing. But that doesn't mean the thing doesn't have an awareness or isn't informed by a lot of ideas that I'm having, at least in the making of it, even if you can't see that literally later. And even I can't remember because you can't remember everything you think. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm making things sometimes with certain thoughts in mind about what's going on in the world. And I'm also making things for all sorts of people. I'm not only directing what I do at an art audience. So, you know, there has to be these points of connection and just relevance, actually. Yeah. And that's interesting, that point about who you're making it for, because mm. you were once not at all an art person. And it seems to me that sort of helped guide you in terms of making Yeah, I've never sort of lost that <laughs> feeling <laughs> in a way, in the same way that you don't. You know, no one's born into some blank page and, and gets to sort of write the whole how the world's going to be themselves. We're all dealing with a set of circumstances that we're initially just thrown in, some sense to say, but just born into, I suppose, is more accurate. And um, but you begin learning everything from that vantage point you learn to speak so you learn to speak with all the inflections that the people around you you know you don't learn it out of the dictionary and it's it's true with most of what you learn and to that extent you're sort of indoctrinated and um not in ways that obviously you can expand yourself but you can't ever take that bit out I don't think and it's really intriguing and I read this happened to somebody else too but the other day I was sitting on the tube looking at the catalogue for this Tate Britain show and I had some of the bunnies open, and I noticed people were looking over at the works, yeah, and they yeah. must have been thinking, what the hell is that? They're catchy, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that must be an attractive response in some way. Yeah, so no, I love that. that. And there's nothing like walking down the street. I, I'm starting to notice this at college. You're suddenly making a, taking a sculpture from one building to another. And there's nothing like walking down the street with a, with a sculpture or a painting even, you know. But, I mean, I'm always very gratified when the guy's delivering the work to an exhibition really like it, or even the guards in museums or or kids, or babies even. It's nice to get a, a genuine response that is a sort of felt one, not just an intellectual exercise or something. You really notice that with Franz Vest again, you know, outside yeah. Tate Modern, he had the, one of those great mm. sort of extraordinary confectionery coloured sculptures and everyone yeah, was, was magnetised to it. Yeah. Right? yeah. Let's talk about music. What music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? I don't always listen to things. I often go down memory lane, or I sometimes think, you know, it suddenly struck me that even though I was... Yoko album albums for years. I hadn't really listened to them that much. I suddenly thought she'd be relevant when I was making the honey pie things. And I suppose I got interested as well about the whole thing of, you know, she's been very undersung in terms of her relationship to the Beatles. I often just elect something that I fancy getting in the spirit of. But I also listen to radio quite a lot. They always put the best things on at like 11 o'clock midnight. And some of those programs like Night Tracks and Late Junction and things are really good. So I often listen to those in the afternoon. Right. And it has a double effect because it's also like getting back into that evening zone in the afternoon. It's such a different sort of landscape to be in. Does it affect the making? Because it, it does. Yeah. I, it does. I think it does. I think, I think everything affects the making. Right. But, but there's so many things that you can't really trace it back again but of course it does and i was wondering if because a lot of your work is quite process heavy right so if i'm thinking about when you're like sticking cigarettes to a car bonnet or whatever <laughs> well, <they are. laughs> do you listen to different things according to the kind of work that you might be making but yeah but not necessarily certain things go with certain work but just what what mood i'm in i definitely selected yoko ono for the honey pie stuff it's a mixture of random and stuff i think i might like to put on i'm listening to a lot of classical music 
The word punkish is often... I think I've done it, I've used the term. But are you a big punk fan? Is punk a thing for you? Not massively. I mean, there's things I quite got into. No, not really. I was a real prog rocker. And I never was a punk in terms of the gear. But on the other hand, I've said, I've said that to certain people and they said, no, but you're a real one. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. You're punk, again, it's attitude. You're a punk in attitude, if not in the terms of the music you listen to. <laughs> but Inner Gadda Davida is a classic example of the kind of proggy stuff. That was the name yeah. of the show. And that came from you, didn't it? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? I can like a lot of things, but they don't have to be art for me. I get a lot of pleasure out of looking at my totally random collection of mugs I've got and how they rearrange themselves on the shelf when you get them out of the dishwasher. I get a lot of pleasure out of ordinary things. And lastly, what's art for? Art just finds a way to be whatever it is. It's an individual thing to different artists and it finds a different path to being art in different times. And I think it will probably continue to do that. I don't know why any more than I know why the world is here or it's like this. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah Lucas, Happy Gas is at Tate Britain in London until the 14th of January 2024. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every week. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. Production, editing, and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack, and the producer is Lewis Jeb. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway. A big thank you to Sarah Lucas. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.